This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. A warm welcome to all who are gathered for worship today. We delight to get to uh, come together again, to gather as God's people in his presence, to give him the worship and praise that is due his name. A special welcome to uh, guests and visitors and to those who are joining us uh, through the internet and through the radio. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 99, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. This is a psalm that praises God for his holiness, for his justice, that he's a God of vengeance, and that he's a God who forgives. And because of all those things, we exalt our God and we worship at his holy name, for our God is holy. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we gather together this evening to remember that you are a God highly exalted, that you are a holy God, a just God, a God of vengeance, but a God also who forgives the iniquity of your people. And so we stand in awe of such a God. We delight that you have come down and come near to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, and pray now that you would enable us to lift our hearts to your very throne, to give you praise and honor and glory, for you are holy. Amen. Let us praise God in song by singing from this same psalm, selection 99a, The Lord God Reigns on High. Stand if you're able, and we'll sing all the stanzas. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Let us join together and confess with our lips what we believe in our hearts using the words of the Apostles' Creed, saying together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us unite our hearts together and come before God in congregational prayer. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts before you on, the, this, on this, the Lord's Day, the day of resurrection and new life, thankful that we can come a second time into your presence and give you the worship and praise that is due your great and holy name. We thank you that you have loved us we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. And we thank you that with Jesus, you give us all that we stand in need of. Indeed, we are a needy people and come with our petitions before you this evening. We remember in prayer those of our number, our loved ones, some near, some far away, who are recovering from illness or injury or surgeries or who are suffering from chronic illness for which there is no hope of recovery in this life. We pray, Father, that you would grant healing grant uh, relief from pain, uh, grant uh, hope, if it be your will, uh, grant, uh, restore to health and strength, but if not, uh, help us to set our hope fully on the grace that will be given to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you would comfort those who mourn. We pray for widows and widowers especially, that you would fill the emptiness of their lives with the light and joy of your love each day. May they experience your mercies new every morning. We pray again for those of our congregation who are gravely ill. We think of our sister Sylvia Nusma, that you would have mercy upon her and grant her spiritual courage and strength from day to day that she may rest secure in your love. Be with our brother Bruce Skibout, that you would have mercy upon him and uh, that you would grant healing if it be your will and make the treatments he is receiving uh, effective. We uh, pray for our pastor, uh, Reverend Lubbers, that you would give his doctors wisdom for his follow-up treatment and give him relief from the discomfort that his seizure this past week has occasioned. May he and his family have a restful vacation and safe travels over the next two weeks and may they be granted full strength uh, to uh, return to their calling here in this congregation. Father, we uh, thank you for being with us in this past week and uh, helping us through difficult times and uh, good times and uh, helping us with our work. We thank you that the uh, team of young people have returned safely from a week's uh, uh, service in uh, Northwest Iowa and uh, we thank you for their willingness to, to go and for those who went with them to chaperone and pray, Father, that uh, their labors may continue to bear fruit in your church and kingdom for a long time. We pray, Father, that you would be with those of our congregation who are looking for work. Some have recently graduated and uh, 
are now uh, in the job market and looking for something. Uh, we pray that they may find that which is suitable to their gifts and abilities. We pray, Father, for families, that you would be with um, uh, husbands and wives, that they may live together in love according to your ordinance for marriage, husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church, and wives uh, submitting to their husbands as the church is called to uh, submit to Christ. On this uh, Lord's Day, we thank you for godly fathers. We thank you that you have granted uh, many men who have uh, uh, done well in bringing up their children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for our fathers and pray that uh, they may uh, be blessed in their, in their labors and uh, in their life. We uh, pray for expectant mothers that they may uh, bring forth children at the proper time, uh, healthy and well, and bring much joy to their uh, families. We uh, pray, Father, for some who have wandered from the faith and broken covenant with you. We pray that you would humble their hearts, show them their sin, fill them with godly sorrow for their sin, that they may repent of their sin and return to the faith and uh, to the church. We pray not only for ourselves, but uh, we pray for our community, we pray for the churches of our community. Father, there are so many congregations in this uh, town. We pray that uh, the pastors uh, in this town will be faithful to your word and preach the gospel in all its uh, fullness and in the power of the Spirit, preaching it boldly and preaching it clearly and calling sinners to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And where denominations or congregations or individuals have made compromise with the false wisdom of the world, we pray that there may be reformation and renewal. May those who hunger for spiritual food find faithful shepherds to feed them. And may Pella be more famous for its strong faith than it is for its ethnic heritage. We pray that you would make us a light, a light on a hill, a light for the gospel in this dark world. Uh, lifting up Jesus Christ and him crucified as the only hope of mankind. We pray that you would uh, strengthen the leaders of this congregation to do the hard work of caring for the flock for whom our Lord died. We pray, Father, for our nation's leaders, that you would raise up leaders for us uh, to, who will promote justice and righteousness and peace and not serve for selfish gain, we pray that they may see that the righteous standards revealed in your word are the righteous standards that uh, we need to be governed by. And Father, as we anticipate a Supreme Court decision that may or may not uh, end uh, legal abortion in, uh, uh, as a federal uh, statute, uh, we pray, Father, that uh, whatever the result, we would work hard to change the hearts and minds of people, to change the culture and to do that by preaching the gospel and uh, uh, lifting high the truth of your word. For we know that uh, more is needed than uh, merely uh, a law on a piece of paper uh, to change the way people behave. We pray, Father, that you would uh, be with our missionaries. We remember today with the rest of the Federation, Reverend Bill Green, our missionary in Costa Rica, we pray for continued progress on their administration, building construction. May, the, may they continue to move forward despite heavy rains that have set back the schedule, provide the funds necessary for supplies, all of which have been inflated in price recently, even to $7 a gallon for gasoline. We praise you for many visitors and new members at the church. We thank you that they are experiencing a growth spurt and uh, pray that you would be with those who are in the church who are struggling with uh, family matters or other problems and uh, others who have not yet returned after the pandemic. And move them to return to the gathering of the saints, which is the work of Christ. We give you thanks and praise for the Christian school. Uh, we give thanks that with the continuing collapse of the state school system, more and more parents are coming uh, to the Christian school when it is recommended to them by friends and family of the church. We give thanks for the increase in enrollment and pray that those parents who are new to Christian education may come to understand its true nature and purpose. Father, we thank you for Reverend uh, Green's work and pray that you would richly uh, bless him and uh, his wife as they uh, labor there in Costa Rica. 
We remember Reverend uh, Bernie Venee as he travels from Alaska to Oskaloosa, arriving this week. We uh, pray that the transition to a new home may go smoothly, and we pray that you would give him many fruitful years of service in your church and kingdom and much joy with his family as he makes his home now in this area. And Father, bless us also as we bring our offering for Wycliffe and the Lemuel family. We pray that you would bless them as they transition to a new uh, calling in Georgia where uh, uh, he will be a, a teacher. We pray, Father, that uh, all may go smoothly and well in that transition. O oh Lord, hear us and answer us, for we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let us continue to worship God by singing together selection number 119F. Let your mercy and your love will uh, stand if you're able and uh, sing all the stanzas of 119F. Our scripture lesson this evening is taken from John chapter 11, page 1,238 in the Pew Bible, 1,238, John chapter 11, beginning at verse 45 and reading through verse 57. John 11, verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this, man's works, this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on they plotted to put him to death. 
Therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into a country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. As far the reading of God's word. Beloved of the Lord, immediately before our text is the account of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Jesus had just performed the greatest miracle of his earthly ministry. He had displayed the glory of God in a powerful way by coming to a man who had been dead for four days, his body decomposing, his body stinking with the rot of death. He had given a command, Lazarus, come forth. And the man rose from the dead. Not only was the stink gone, but he was alive and well and restored to his family. And there was a large crowd that witnessed this. The glory of God was displayed so that you and I would not doubt that Jesus is able to raise us from the dead as well. And the glory of God was displayed in this great miracle in order for you and I to not doubt that Jesus is able to do for us anything that we need in accordance with his will. You should not doubt his ability to forgive your sins. You may think your sins are too great, but if you humble your heart before him and confess your sins, he has the power to wipe them away, to take them and cast them into the depths of the sea and to remember them no more. So great is his power. If you are suffering from temptation and addiction and you seek wisdom from him and strength from him, he will give you that strength in order to overcome the power of sin in your life. If you are struggling with broken relationships and don't know how to proceed, and you humble your heart before him and seek wisdom from him, he has the power to restore broken relationships. He has great power. If he can raise the dead who have been dead four days, he can do all that we need in accordance with his will. But now tonight we want to look at the varied responses to this great miracle. There was a crowd who saw it, who were eyewitnesses. We want to look at their response. There were others who weren't there, who heard about it, and we want to look at their response. And the first thing that we took, take note of is that the, the, the miracle awakened faith in many, but not all, who witnessed it. Now we're talking just about the eyewitnesses here. Among the eyewitnesses, many believed, but not all. You would think that Anyone who saw such a miracle would be amazed, astonished, blown away by what he or she had seen and become strong believers for the rest of their lives. But that didn't happen. Many believed, but even among those who believed, we don't know just how strong their faith was. You know, faith based on seeing miracles is not the strongest kind of faith. Jesus would later give a special benediction, a special blessing to those who believe without seeing. Uh, But uh, among those who uh, saw Jesus' miracles uh, throughout his ministry, many of them fell away. Uh, For example, in chapter 2, we read that uh, Jesus did not entrust himself to those who believed in him because he, he knew them. And in chapter 6, many of Jesus' disciples gave up on him because of his hard sayings about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And in chapter 8, Jesus told those who believed in him things, those who believed in him, things that they didn't want to hear, and, and they stopped following him. We wonder where these many believers were just a short uh, time later when the crowds in Jerusalem were crying, crucify him, crucify him. However, 
weak faith is better than no faith at all. And on several occasions where people had faith because Jesus performed miracles, they were blessed by Jesus and Jesus assured them that uh, through faith they uh, would be saved. Now, we read here that many believe, but then in the next sentence it says, some, but some, went and told the Pharisees. The, uh, the fact that it says many and not all, and then turns to a smaller group and says, but some, uh, means there's a division here. These some, uh, we might try to think the best of them and think that they're, they're going to tell the Pharisees the great works of Jesus to say to the Pharisees, Pharisees, you're wrong for rejecting him. You should believe in him because you won't guess what he just did for, for Lazarus. We would like to attribute good motives to them. But at this stage, it's, it's really hard to do that. Uh, when Jesus healed the man who had been born blind, the Pharisees already started excommunicating people uh, from the temple and from uh, the, the religious uh, ceremonies and so forth. If they said anything good about Jesus, they cast that man out and uh, he became a pariah among uh, them because uh, he had uh, confess faith in Jesus. And so nobody who's, who's uh, excited about Jesus now is eager to go talk to the Pharisees about it. Plus, we don't read about any retribution coming against these people who have come. And so uh, we can safely assume that these people uh, did not believe. Even though they were witnesses, they did not believe. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees uh, were not won over by the reports they heard, and because there is no retaliation, we can assume then that uh, this division has taken place among those who see it. Some who witnessed the raising of Lazarus believed, many of them did, but some did not, and uh, went running to uh, the enemy to tell the enemy, look, you gotta do something, something's going on here that uh, we don't like, and, and you better uh, take some action. Now, this division, in the crowd of eyewitnesses reminds us that throughout Jesus' ministry, his words and his deeds divided the Jews. And the words and deeds of Jesus continue to divide the covenant community. Jesus said this would happen. In Matthew 10, we read, do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than he loves me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone who puts family unity or community unity ahead of unity in the truth has not understood this call to Christian discipleship. You know, about 40 years ago, give or take a few years, I was a delegate to a synod where one of my fellow ministerial uh, uh, delegates uh, rose and uh, he said, I want to tell you a story. And the story was about his daughter and his daughter's desire to be a minister, to be ordained as a minister. And the point of the story was to shame the synod into putting any barriers uh, in his daughter's way to uh, becoming a minister. This past week, I saw a live streamed on uh, the computer uh, a synodical, synodical delegate standing in the same auditorium saying, I want to tell you a story. And the story was about his daughter, his daughter who wanted to marry her girlfriend. And he too spoke to try to convince the synod to uh, change their understanding of Scripture in order that his family might be kept intact and that uh, uh, he loved his daughter and didn't want the church to put any obstacles in his daughter's way. And Jesus says, if anyone loves son or daughter more than they love me, he is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I'm sure that 
uh, when this congregation was founded, uh, it uh, caused divisions in families, and many of you may still bear the cross that uh, uh, you had to take up at that time. But we know that God gives grace to bear that cross and that this is the mark of discipleship. He came not to bring peace, but sometimes even those of our own household will be our enemies. Those who deny the truth of the scriptures deny Jesus Christ. Christian unity is unity in the spirit and that spiritual unity manifests itself in a common confession of the truth. Now, as long as we are in this life, we'll never agree on everything, but there are some truths of Scripture that are foundational and abundantly clear. Most of them are contained in the Reformed confessions that have been time-tested for 400 years. And when we see people confessing that truth as we confess it, we can be assured that we are one in spirit with them. But where there are those who know those truths and deny them, contradict them, knowingly contradict them, then we have to say there's a different spirit at work. And to try to maintain organizational unity where there is no spiritual unity is a sham and a constant source of grief to try to hold it together. No, Christ came to bring division, and we see it even in the eyewitnesses of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. We are also reminded by this passage of the, of the hardness of the human heart, and that even the raising of a man from the dead four days after he has died is, is not enough to convince unbelievers to, to put their faith in Jesus. Jesus had spoken about that once in Luke 16, 31. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The human heart is dead in sin. And unless God makes it alive, we have no hope. Do not think that because you believe in Jesus that you are better than those who don't believe. All the credit for your salvation must go to God, who works new life in us by his resurrection power. Now, in addition to awakening faith in many but not all, we see that this miracle aroused murderous hatred among the Jewish leaders. It aroused murderous hatred among the Jewish leaders. Regardless of the strength of the faith of those who believed, their faith was sufficient to arouse very strong negative response among the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders were alarmed and aroused to action. They called a meeting of the ruling body, the the council or the Sanhedrin, uh, a body made up of uh, Sadducees and uh, Pharisees. The Sadducees, who were the liberals, the progressives of the time, uh, were in the majority, mostly the descendants of Aaron. The Pharisees, uh, the conservative, Uh, legalists. Uh, We shouldn't, uh, uh, the Sadducees tended toward antinomianism and the Pharisees toward legalism. Uh, Neither one was in the right, but uh, the Pharisees were in the minority. Anyway, they have this council that the Romans allow them certain uh, prerogatives with regard to local rule, and they called a meeting of the council, and uh, they came together, and they were saying, what shall we do? And they weren't just looking for a plan, they were expressing frustration in the fact that nothing that they had done uh, has been very effective. They had threatened and actually uh, excommunicated somebody for believing in Jesus. They had been sending people to trick him and try to uh, catch him up in his words and make him uh, say something blasphemous or something that they could charge him with. Nothing they were doing was working, and they're saying, you know, what else, what else can we do? The, uh, the, the nuance of the Greek in verse 47 is not just what shall we do, but what can we do? They're frustrated. Uh, he's performing signs, and they can't uh, contradict that, that fact. They can't deny it. Uh, the, uh, the sign of the healing of the man born blind was just a few weeks earlier, and then Lazarus, and both were 
witnessed by large audiences, you would think that they would have second thoughts and begin to say, well, you know, maybe he's in the right and we're in the wrong, but no, uh, the only thing they can think of is their own position. They fear that messianic fervor will rise to fever pitch and incite a rebellion against Rome. They'll ask Jesus to lead uh, an army against Rome, and uh, these leaders are convinced that if that were to happen, Rome would crush them, and then all would be lost. Their nation, their position, uh, they fear. That's, That's all they can think about here. Well, their, their fears are not unfounded. Their fears are quite uh, realistic because that's exactly what would happen 40 years later uh, when there was a, a Jewish revolt, not by Christians led by Jesus, but by the Jewish zealots uh, revolting against Rome. And it began in AD 67 and culminated in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and the killing of over a million and a half Jews uh, who had uh, fled to the city thinking they would be safe where the temple was, but indeed uh, God had will to uh, destroy it. It's ironic that they think they must kill Jesus to prevent this from happening, when in reality it happened as a punishment uh, from God for not believing in Jesus and for rejecting the gospel for 40 years. Now, this passage shows us that those who have made up their minds against Jesus will not be convinced by any evidence or any rational argument. Like the unbelief of the eyewitnesses, the hard-heartedness of the leaders reminds us that only sovereign, irresistible grace can save us. We love him because he first loved us. He came to you in the darkness of your heart and mind and turned on the lights. He gave you a new birth, a spiritual rebirth from above by supernatural power of the Holy Spirit working in you through the Word. Not only must you give all praise for your salvation uh, to God, but you must conduct yourself with humility toward those who do not yet believe. Now, seeing this hatred should also remind us that we too should expect to be hated. Jesus said in John 7, the world hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. And again, he said, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. In 1 John chapter 3, in John's first epistle, he, he reminds us why Cain killed Abel. He said, Cain killed Abel because Cain's work, works were wicked and Abel's were righteous. Cain saw righteousness and he hated it and he killed his brother before it. And John goes on to say in 1 John 3, verse 13, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. You and I are commanded to love our enemies. But the proponents of the sexual revolution in our culture, the uh, the rainbow coalition, as they like to refer to themselves, they do not feel that they are under any moral compunction to love us. That's why they pour out their venom daily against Christians and seek to cancel us in any way that they can. It may come that uh, some of you will lose your jobs because you won't go along with the uh, sexual revolution. You may be in a profession that is uh, licensed by government standards, and in order to maintain your license and your uh, uh, work, you have to uh, conform. Uh, It may be that uh, ministers will be jailed for hate speech if they uh, preach against uh, certain sins. Uh, We need to be prepared for this, but not afraid. We should not be afraid. Jesus says that when you are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And we should also remember to bless those who persecute us and pray for those who despitefully use us. We may not retaliate uh, and uh, respond in kind when they hate us. Well, while expressing their frustration over Jesus' success, uh, the high priest, Caiaphas, takes charge of the discussion. 
And we see that the miracle of Lazarus raised from the dead elicits from him an unconscious prophecy of Jesus' substitutionary atonement. Uh, the, uh, the high priest, uh, with blunt arrogance, tells them, they don't know anything. You guys don't know anything. You don't know what you're talking about. What we need to do is kill Jesus in order to save the nation. How he justified the killing of an innocent man, we don't know. For him, it was all political. It was all pragmatic. Sadly, that kind of attitude is evident in a lot of current day politics where people are not governed by uh, principles, by uh, great moral truths, but only what is practical, only what is pragmatic, only what will enrich uh, our financial position or save our position or whatever. That uh, is what many people are guided by, so we shouldn't be too surprised to see this in ancient times as well. Caiaphas is thinking that in order to prevent a possible Jewish revolt against Rome led by Jesus and a mob, and in order to preserve their privileged position, uh, they need to, uh, to put Jesus to death. At this point, there has been no trial. There's been no witnesses bringing forth evidence. There's been no uh, weighing the evidence and coming to a verdict. It's simply a sentence imposed. He has to die. From that day on, they plotted to put him to death. A trial would come later, uh, but it was a show trial only to uh, justify the sentence that had already been determined. That's why Peter in his Pentecost sermon says that Jesus was crucified by the hands of lawless men. But when Caiaphas says this, that Jesus ought to die in order to save the political structure of the nation and to save the position of the scribes and Pharisees, uh, that one man ought to die instead of the whole nation being crushed in a Roman uh, uh, onslaught against the rebellion. Uh, John points out the, the great irony of Ca Ca Caiaphas' words. Uh, Although he was motivated by selfish desire, nevertheless, as high priest, he was speaking for God. And what Caiaphas was uh, proposing was indeed God's plan, that uh, one man should die to save the nation. Of course, God was not concerned with saving the political structure of the day, and God was not concerned with saving the Jewish uh, leadership uh, God is concerned to save people from the guilt of our sins. Uh, Caiaphas was uh, saying that Jesus should die on behalf of the nation and in its place, and he uses language which is sacramental or sacrificial language, language associated with the sacrifices of the temple. And John tells us that's God speaking through his high priest and giving, uh, uh, God is giving those words a deeper and richer meaning. Both understand that Jesus' death is to be the death of a substitute. One dies in place of the many. But while Caiaphas is only thinking of saving the political structure, John wants us to think about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John also wants us to remember that the death of Jesus is not just for the Jews, but for all the children of God scattered abroad, that is for the Gentiles as well, those whom God is gathering together. You know, uh, it, uh, we should uh, see in that uh, verse uh, 52, I think it is, yeah, 52, that word gather. Uh, that's the work of God. He's gathering his people. And in recognition of that, that's why we gather in, the, in his presence together, gather together, because that's the work of God. Now, it's good for us to remember this, this great truth of the scripture, the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross, or what theologians call the penal substitutionary atonement. Penal is a word that is related to the word penalty, of or relating to a penalty. We sometimes speak about uh, jails as penal institutions because that's where people pay the penalty or are sent to pay the penalty for their crimes. And uh, laws that uh, require punishment are referred to as the penal code. 
Well, when we speak about penal substitutionary atonement, we're talking about an atonement that is a payment that pays a penalty and that it's done by a substitute. All crime cries out for justice. We see that again and again when there's some mass murder or mass shooting or some horrible crime against uh, human beings. Uh, everybody is up in arms and somebody has to pay. Uh, there has to be justice in this world. And uh, that's because God is a just God. And uh, he has promised that even though human justice doesn't always get it right, in the end, he will get it right. Well, either you have to pay for your own sins or you have to find someone to pay your sins for you. Imagine a 17-year-old uh, charged with a traffic fine and he goes to court and the court uh, the judge says $1,000 or 30 days in jail and 17-year-old doesn't have $1,000. So uh, uh, dad says, can I pay it? And the judge says, I don't care where the money comes from as long as the fine is paid uh, I'm satisfied. Well, that's with God as well. The, the crime, your crimes, my crimes have to be paid for, and God is willing to take uh, a substitute. And the glorious good news of the gospel is that there is one with infinite strength, the, the divine Son of God, uh, who uh, became human so that he might take our place and take in the infinite wrath of God. He had to be human to take our place. He had to be divine in order to absorb uh, infinite wrath and, and pay it all. And uh, he is both. He is both human and divine. And he has come and he has indeed made payment for the penalty of our sin. As was uh, mentioned by our pastor this morning, uh, there's been a lot of talk about this in some uh, reform circles uh, recently. And that's because... Uh, uh, not just in that denomination, but in others as well. There are those who think that uh, the idea of an angry God who punishes sin is inconsistent with the idea of a, a loving God. You know, this is not anything new. Uh, there was an ancient heretic in the first few centuries named Marcion who pretty much believed the same thing, rejected most of the Old Testament because he didn't like that angry God of the Old Testament. And... Uh, uh, even today, you think you hear people talking about an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. The Old Testament God's the angry God. The New Testament God is uh, a loving God. But uh, th that's because they don't know the Scriptures. Jesus talks about more about hell than anybody else uh, in the Bible. Well, uh, to accommodate this uh, rejection of the justice of God, some are promoting the fact that the death of Christ in uh, the Bible is described under several different themes. Uh, it's associated uh, with uh, uh, things like uh, uh, the moral influence view of the uh, atonement or uh, with uh, his uh, victory over death or with liberation or with uh, paying a ransom and uh, with redemption. It's associated with reconciliation. It has all kinds of nuances and some are saying, uh, thankfully, the church that dealt with it this past week uh, came down with a, a good position on this. But nevertheless, uh, in many places, people are saying, uh, as long as you affirm one of those themes, you don't have to affirm all of them. But what they ought to recognize is that uh, the penal substitutionary work of Christ is foundational to every other aspect of the death of Christ. For example, Christ is held up in Scripture as an example to us to inspire us to sacrificial service because he sacrificed himself in death, we should offer our lives as a living sacrifice of service to others. Uh, his example should uh, inspire us. But the inspiration is only due to the fact that his death actually saved somebody. You know, if he simply died on the cross to say, see how much I love you, but didn't save anybody, we would say, that's a pretty useless way of, of impressing upon us uh, his love. It would be like a, a fireman arriving at a burning house and knowing that the house is empty and that there's nobody in it to be saved, runs in anyway because he thinks that's what firemen ought to do and everybody's inspired when they see a fireman run into a, a burning house. But if he should die in there, everybody would say, how stupid. That's not inspirational. That's foolish that he should risk his life and die when there was nobody in there to save, you know. Um, 
That's just not inspirational. Only if he was attempting to save somebody, if there was really somebody in there and he he went in there and and braved the flames in order to try to rescue that person. That's that's inspirational. You know, that's what the, the firemen did at the Twin Towers. They were helping people get out. But if everybody had gotten out and they still went up, uh, that would be foolish. Well, it's the same with uh, everything uh, else that uh, if there's no substitutionary atonement, there's no victory, there's no redemption, there's no liberation, there's, there's nothing there if this is not uh, foundation. Uh, Penal substitutionary atonement is the foundation to uh, all the biblical themes. And uh, it's not just a teaching of the Reformed confessions. It's at the heart of the gospel that uh, Christ died for the ungodly, that we might be saved, that uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us, that God laid on him the iniquity of us all, and that by his stripes uh, we are healed. He's the Passover lamb who... Uh, whose blood is shed so that we might escape the uh, aveng- avenging angel. The author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 9:13, for if the blood of, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of the defiled person with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the puri- purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God? purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He offered himself up as a sacrifice, and his sacrifice purifies us so that we can serve the living God. John proclaimed, John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You should rejoice that Christ loved you and loved you so much that he voluntarily took all the guilt of your sin upon himself and then suffered the punishment that your sins deserve so that God's justice would be satisfied, so that your sins would be forgiven, so that you could be adopted into the family of God and become heir of eternal life. Do not trust in your own works to make you right with God. Trust in the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ. Trust in his death for you. For the author of Hebrew goes on to say in chapter 9, verse 28, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. May you be found among those who are eagerly waiting for him. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that the death of Christ, or the the raising of Lazarus, uh, produced such varied responses. We pray that we would be inspired by what Jesus did to believe in him and trust in him and trust in his atoning work uh, who uh, died in our place. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us respond to God's word by singing together selection number 431. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me whom him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? We'll sing, stand if you're able and sing all the stanzas.
At this time, the uh, deacons will receive the offering for uh, Wycliffe and for the ministry of the Lemayhews, and after which we'll sing the doxology number 213, standing if you're able and singing all the stanzas.
Receive now God's parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.